This presentation focuses on using alternative energy technologies to enhance resilience. My name is Eliza Hotchkiss, and I'm a Disaster Recovery and Resilience Lead within the Strategic Energy Analysis Center at the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL. My focus is on analysis and outreach to increase integration of alternative technologies and best practices at all levels of government for resilient energy infrastructure. As part of a team of experts deployed across the nation to support FEMA with disaster recovery, I've seen the impacts of natural disasters on communities firsthand and contributed to numerous recovery and preparedness plans. Those lessons have been applied in the Caribbean, Pacific Islands, Africa, and across the U.S. to identify ways to increase the resilience of communities and nations. I led the Colorado Project for Resilience for the White House Council on Environmental Quality under the Obama administration the results of which have been developed into a resilience roadmap for broader replicability to enhance resilient communities across the U.S. Prior to joining NREL, I lived and worked in England, supporting development and implementation of building performance standards for the European Union, greenhouse gas inventorying and reduction programs, appliance labeling, and carbon footprint labels for products and industries. In this training, we will start with an overview of resilience, covering the definition of resilience for the purposes of this training, why it's important, and integrated planning to achieve resilience. We'll cover how to assess portfolios and understand load profiles to understand common mitigation measures, then discuss how alternative energy systems such as solar photovoltaics can be designed to avoid disruptions and provide power during grid outages. Finally, we'll end with some best practices to illustrate where resilient systems are already being implemented across the country. This presentation is organized into the following sections. Defining resilience, resilience overview, energy resilience, alternative energy, such as solar photovoltaics for resilience, and then success stories and resources that are available for your information. The word resilience is a hot topic. If you look up definitions of resilience, you'll find hundreds of definitions from different sources. Definitions include words like anticipate, prepare for, recover, adapt, withstand. It can become overwhelming very quickly. Presidential directives and executive orders, various federal agencies and organizations all have their own definitions of resilience. To simplify resilience and to incorporate solutions that NREL uses in daily work, we use the definition shown on the screen. For the purposes of this presentation, we'll focus on the definition of resilience as the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions through adaptable and holistic planning and technical solutions. This training will go into how we're using the definition, but we're focusing on the ability to continue to provide power within a building or a campus or even a city through holistic design and technical solutions, which include alternative energy systems. Goal setting is essential for resilience planning because there are multiple drivers for enhancing resilience. Cities within the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program, such as the city of Boulder in Colorado, have set goals as part of their resilience framework. While resilience in the 100 Resilient Cities program is used much more broadly and incorporates health, well-being, and economics, we are only covering the energy sector, and critical infrastructure is included in this training. Setting resilience goals to help guide projects or actions is critical to the success of any resilience program. In all of the resilience planning that we do here at the laboratory, we incorporate a stakeholder-driven process and determine where there are threats and vulnerabilities by looking at potential impacts and the probability of occurrence as a way to rank risks. Once we've determined where there are threats and vulnerabilities and have scored them, we can determine cost-effective mitigation strategies that will reduce risk and enhance resilience. Weighing the consequences and their likelihood is one way to prioritize and discuss some potential resilience options and create potential strategies. Understanding threats, vulnerabilities, and mitigation options allows for setting goals. It's important to know what you're planning to become resilient to and for how long. 
This process will help determine the type of systems that can help meet those goals and the policies or financial mechanisms that can help with the implementation phase. It's important to remember that resilience cannot be achieved in a silo. Hardening or improving one part of a system will not ensure resilience as a whole. Therefore, integrated planning is essential. If you look at the slide, it shows that there's a city with a number of different competing projects. This next visual indicates that if these projects are consolidated into a strategic process, you're more apt to solve multiple problems with limited resources, and this can be helpful for implementing projects and achieving goals in a number of areas. For example, cities undertaking resilience planning may decide to focus on critical infrastructure first as a way to prioritize efforts and projects. If those critical infrastructure projects include energy efficiency and affordability or microgrids, a number of different goals can be achieved at the same time. Energy resilience can only be achieved by understanding energy needs and targeting specific areas. It's important to understand load profiles and critical loads. If you know that your climate zone means more energy is going to be used on air conditioning in the summer months, then identifying how different facilities use energy can help when creating systems that are appropriate for specific buildings and the critical loads within those buildings. As an example, an office building with a data center is going to have a load profile that's similar throughout the year, um, but that profile is going to be different from a hospital. Hospitals, for example, need purified air to circulate in patient wards and operating rooms, as well as specialized electrical equipment to monitor patients, and they use a lot of hot water and have sterilization processes. These loads are going to be different from an office building, which means there are different opportunities to incorporate energy efficiency measures to reduce the load before alternative energy is installed, which could make the renewable energy or alternative energy system more cost effective. Another key piece to energy resilience is understanding how power is generated and distributed to different facilities and points of use. We don't expect everyone to become an electrical engineer or understand the complexities of our modern grid systems. However, it is helpful to know a bit about generation, transmission, and distribution when discussing energy resilience. Understanding how the energy system can be impacted through disruptive events will help identify effective mitigation strategies. As well as boundaries of control, they're going to be different within a campus, and a utility, and these will help with establishing effective partnerships. Costs of electricity will also help understand the return on investment with specific technologies. Which brings us to the third piece of energy resilience. Understanding common causes of disruption to a power system will help in designing more resilient systems. If you live in an area where ice storms are prevalent or hurricanes occur with high winds, you know that power outages can be seasonal. If you live in an area with an older grid where the infrastructure is weakening and needs to be replaced, the outages may occur more frequently but be less predictable. Understanding what causes power outages can be helpful in predicting when you need additional resilience or how to incorporate those into your projects. The mitigation measures that are used for grid resilience vary depending on the threats and vulnerabilities, as well as the geographic location. This slide shows a few of the mitigation measures that are commonly used to reduce risk and disruption to grid systems from various threats. Undergrounding critical lines can be costly, but in areas with common outages from downed trees, hurricane force winds, or tornadoes, this can be a worthwhile investment. Reducing the energy end use in buildings through energy efficiency or passive survivability techniques can reduce the need for energy within buildings. These mitigation measures are grouped in demand-side energy efficiency. Diversifying energy generation sources and locations may be one way to improve resilience, which ties in with deploying distributed generation through the use of alternative energy solutions such as solar PV, microgrids, and energy storage solutions which we'll talk about more in the next few slides. And finally, smart grids that allow for more granular control and fault detection can be another mitigation measure for utilities to consider. The graphic at the bottom of the slide shows how different non-market and market-adopted techniques can provide rapid response or be incorporated into long-term planning. 
This image may be familiar to you all. It's a photograph of Manhattan during Hurricane Sandy, where entire New York neighborhoods lost power during the storm, and millions of people were left without power due to grid systems being out of commission for weeks after the storm. Hurricane Sandy caused $65 billion in damages in the United States, making it the second costliest weather disaster in American history, behind only hurricanes Katrina and Rita, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This data is prior to the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, but may still hold true. What's interesting about hurricanes and other extreme weather events is that they highlight vulnerabilities in the grid system. On-site alternative energy technologies alone do not equate to a resilient system. They do provide resilience, but they need to be designed correctly to be able to provide power during a grid outage. During some forensic reviews of wastewater treatment facilities with on-site alternative energy technologies after Hurricane Sandy, NREL noticed a few key points that need to be incorporated into on-site generation technologies so that they are resilient system. They need interconnection agreements that allow for operation when the grid is down. They need islanding controls to allow for safe operation when the grid is down and being repaired by linemen. And energy storage is useful to incorporate to ensure continuity of operations when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. With on-site energy generation in a grid-connected situation, island and controls and battery systems are ideal for enhancing resilience. A schematic is shown on the screen that shows what a direct current photovoltaic grid tied system looks like with battery backup compared to an alternating current system. Grid-connected PV with storage systems are used to first meet a customer's load and then export excess PV generation or photovoltaic generation to the grid. This requires an interconnection agreement and net meter, but allows customers to sell energy back to the grid to help with the return on investment of a PV system. When wired for backup power, it is common to install a critical loads sub panel and use PV plus energy storage systems like a battery bank to provide power to essential loads. This could include refrigeration, essential lighting, pumps, or specialized equipment in hospitals, just as a few examples. The example shown on the screen is an analysis that NREL staff conducted to determine the benefits of combining a PV system and battery bank with a conventional diesel generator for a campus. The results were that the PV and battery system had a comparable life cycle cost to a diesel generator but help to extend the probability of having power from seven and eight days to about 14 days. The reason for this extension in survivability of an outage is that the PV and battery system are able to extend the useful lifetime of the diesel fuel. They use solar energy when it's available to store it in the battery system and reduces the need to use the diesel fuel for all of the 24 hours in those first seven days of an outage. The base case, lowest cost solution, and then the proposed system for resilience are all shown in the chart. As mentioned on the previous slide, the costs of islanded PV systems with battery storage can be comparable to a conventional system. NREL staff have researched how resilience can be valued and are finding that the net present value with resilience valued can nearly double the net present value, or the difference between the costs and the benefits. This may be one example of where additional equipment such as battery banks and islanding controls with dynamic inverters could be justified, but the predicted outage frequency and duration may impact the return on investment. Financial benefits and resilience benefits may be one way to prioritize projects beyond the loads to be served, the criticality of those loads, and the best technical options. Siting systems so that they can withstand natural hazards and be physically resilient is also incredibly important. The last thing we want is for an investment to be made and for siting of these systems to not be considered. It's important to prevent systems from being destroyed during hurricanes or other extreme weather events because these systems can provide power when the grid is down. To summarize, 
Resilient PV systems will incorporate on-site generation that is sized for optimum performance or critical loads, will include islanding controls and energy storage, and will be sited to ensure minimal damage during severe weather events. Procurement and financing options could be incorporated that accommodate the value of resilience. Using alternative energy, such as solar PV, is not something that's pie in the sky or hypothetical. On this slide, we show a number of different resilience success stories that could provide examples, but also additional information as to where solar PV is being used with battery storage in different buildings, such as critical infrastructure. Florida has launched a Sun Smart Schools and Emergency Shelters program. Borrego Springs, California has installed a microgrid, and Stafford Hill, Vermont also has a microgrid. All three of these projects include PV and battery storage. Two other examples include the Marcus Garvey Apartments in Brooklyn, New York, which include a microgrid that has a PV system, an energy storage system, and a fuel cell to provide four-hour daily load reductions and resilience during grid outages. In February of 2018, Massachusetts launched a $1.5 million grant for 14 different communities to conduct feasibility studies for resilient microgrids. And on the final slide, we show a number of resources that can be used to provide additional information or provide examples or ideas of where microgrids, distributed energy resources, solar PV, and alternative energy can be used. The first resource is an alternative energy generation opportunities and critical infrastructure study that was done for the state of New Jersey.